Thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to join the third week of the Locked In Learning Series. Today, we are going to be talking about data logging on the Unistream. So quick overview of the schedule here. This is the third out of the four week series. We are gonna be covering data logging next week. Next Tuesday, we will be covering communications with Unilogic. So at an overview, data logging is just recording values. Um, it can be basically any value on the controller, a uh, number, a bit, a string, it can be really any type of data that you might need to keep track of for whatever reason. Um, some people will need to do record keeping. Um, there are certain compliances and things that they have to keep records of to prove that nobody uh, did uh, make a change. And it's also very useful for troubleshooting. Um, you know, if you have a process that's doing something at a particular time, and you know nobody's on site at that time, things like that, uh, you can set up data logging to track certain you know attributes of that issue and figure out what's going on. So in Unilogic, there are a number of different methods for data sampling for keeping track of these values. So you could use a data sampler which is going to periodically track a value. Uh, that period can be very, very fast, uh, you know, a tenth of a second, uh, you know, or even a millisecond. So every millisecond, you could be recording a value, uh, but it is still a time-based method of recording those values. You could also use the ladder or an HMI trigger, a button on the screen, uh, to log something aperiodically. So if you need to log something when a certain event happens, uh, you can do that through the ladder or, you know, on the HMI when a user presses a button. And then separate from manually recording those values, um, we do have alarms. We have an alarm system built into the controller. And that alarm system has an automatic log that's kept. So we'll take a look at one of those alarm logs that's automatically generated for you. And then a pretty rudimentary version of uh, data logging is to use vectors. Vectors are really just a series of the same data type. So if you're tracking the temperature, um, for example, if your temperature was in an integer 32 value, um, you could have a vector of integer 32 values, meaning multiple integer 32 values in a row. And if you wanted, you could kind of, you know, log the data through that vector, um, just using that internal memory, just using the tags. Not nearly as common when we're getting into true data logging. And then once you have the data, you know, what, what are you doing with it? How is it useful for you? So you can take the data and you can show it right on the data table. So if you're logging information to a data table, which you can almost think of like an Excel file, uh, you know, rows and columns, you can display that right on the HMI. You can also uh, put the trend on the HMI, that periodic one where we're tracking a value every time period, we can track that graphically. Uh, and then we can also save the log files. So either the data tables, the alarms, whatever it may be, uh, you can back that information up to a file, uh, push it to your SD card, push it to your USB stick, um, and not rely on internal memory. Uh, and then you can push that to a computer and now you have a separate from our PLC, you know, permanent record of, of what's happened. So the goals for today. So what we're gonna do, just a quick overview of what we're gonna be creating inside of Unilogic today. We are gonna be making a data table and we are going to log the date and the time as well as the operator that is making some change in the system and then what that system change is. So in this case, we're going to track when the operator logs in or logs out and then we're also going to track some change in the system that that operator is making once they have logged in. Now for the data sampler, uh, we are going to create a few pieces, uh, a few numbers that are going to just be changing. So we're gonna have, these could represent three different process values that you wanna track in your system. 
uh, we are going to log all three of those values periodically, and then we are going to graph those. We're going to show them on screen, and then I'm going to go over a couple different ways that you can play with the ranges on those graphed, uh, on the graphs so you can uh, see what the interface is like with that information. And then we're also going to create a CSV from that data sampler as well, a comma separated variable file uh, or you know, an Excel file. So not using our data table formats, but actually having a full fledged you know, industry standard Excel file that you can work with. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we're going to quickly review uh, an alarm log. All right. So here is Unilogic. And what I'd like to do is I just want to quickly go over some things that I have done ahead of time just to save us a little bit of time here. So the first thing I want to point out is this RTC to ASCII function. And you can get this RTC to ASCII function through the examples. So if you go to help and then download sample apps, there is a folder in there, the UDFB, User Defined Function Block folder. And you can right click in your module and import that UDFB from that folder, as I've done here. And we have taken the uh, we've taken the work out of doing date time conversions. So you don't have to worry about anything that's actually going on inside of this function. All we have to do is call the function to generate a date or a timestamp. So if we are if our goal here is to track the login logouts and we are going to be keeping track of that with a timestamp, the username, and an event, the very first thing that we can do is we can create that timestamp. So if we take this RTC to ASCII, and I'll drag and drop it in, this is going to be for my date, and I'm going to also have another one for my time. And now if I click on this function and I go to the comment here, I can see the format and for my time, I will do hours and minutes. And for my date, I will do day, month, year. Actually, let's do month, day, year. So we'll do 10 for our date, and we will do zero for our time. So we will do a 10 for our date. And we will do a zero for our time. And now I am creating these as ASCII strings. So it is going to be a string. And I am making the maximum length 15. And the reason I am doing 15 is because this RTC to ASCII function block has one function out, which is that tag. And that is a length 15. So all the different formats of this, the maximum it would ever hit is 15. So the output of this function we want as a length 15. Length 15. So with those two blocks, I now have my date and I have my time. And these are going to be perpetually updated. So, you know, every scan of the program, you know, the current date and the current time is going to populate those blocks. Next, what we're going to go for is the username. So, with Unilogic, we have user access control. It is a built in user management system. So, if you enable user access control, I am going to force a login, meaning if somebody is not logged in, it is going to pull up the box and force somebody to log in before you can continue in the program. And just for the simple program, I'm going to make the minimum length for the password four. You could put other requirements on that as well. So we have different access levels. and different groups, and the different groups are assigned different access levels. And these access levels are what uh, are linked to the elements 
on the on the screen. So a screen that has that requires uh, L2 permissions, a standard operator would not be able to push that button. So in our case, we're just going to go simply with operator, manager, and admin. And let's add three users. Let's add an operator, a manager, and an admin. And just for simple passwords here, I'm just doing the first letter of the name four times. Not a good real password, but just for quick see it. So now we have some users. And by adding that user access control, you can see down in the global memory and then user access control. If we click on the struct, you'll see that we get a number of uh, tags that give us feedback about this system. So anytime there's a change, such as a, a login, a log out, the event update bit is going to be set, and it's up to me to reset it. And then I also get an event type, which can be found in the help file. So here are those event types. So a one means a login, a two means a log out, a four means a group change. So you get feedback about what's going on there. And some other information, including the username. Now our goal is to log date time stamp plus the username. So this is the username that we're interested in. And you can see that it is of a type string UTF-32. So we're just going to keep that in mind when we're creating our data table. So with those two things, we now have our time stamp, we have our username, and last but not least, we need some event to log. So I'm going to go to my data table screen. I created these screens ahead of time, but there is nothing on them other than the menu screen has a few buttons ready to have actions linked. Uh, but nothing has any functionality yet. So I'm going to go to my data table screen. And we're just going to use a simple uh, on off switch representing a process running or not running. And we are going to log that changing process and which user is starting or stopping that process. So I'm going to make a switch. I'll go to my image elements. And then I will go to binary image variable and make this a bit larger. And let's link some images here. So when we're off, we will be red and off. When we're on, we'll go green on. Now what we are linking this to a process state and the action for when we push this. So whenever we push this button, we want to toggle the process state off to on, on to off. And then I'll also throw in a binary text just to give some feedback. Again, we will use that process state and we will say when it is a zero, the process disabled. Process disabled and process enabled. Fit to optimal size so we can fit both of those texts. So as we switch between, this will let us know and we can visually see with the up and down. And every time that changes, we want to log the username and the timestamp that that happened. So we now have all of our pieces in place to build our data table. So the first way we're going to track information is through this data table. 
And the first thing you do when working with data tables is define a structure. So you can see if I go to data tables here on the left and I want to add a new table to be saving our information to, you can see that it is looking for a structure to base the data table from. So the data tables are fundamentally based on these structures. So I'm gonna go to my structures. I'm gonna add a new structure. And let's call this process log. And now it's asking us for the members. And the members are the columns in our data tables. So you can see over here on the right that we're going to be able to say how many rows we want. But the columns are going to be one column per struct member. So in our case, we are going to do date, time, name, uh, and the process state. So the first thing is going to be a string with a maximum length of 15. Again, from that date time stamp, that maximum length is 15. Call this date. We'll call this time. Again, 15 type string. We have date, time. Next, we want the username. Now, if you remember, the username was a string UTF-32. And if you had usernames that were potentially very long, we could definitely make this longer. In our case, I'm not going to have any user that's larger than 15. And last but not least, we want a string to tell us if the process is started or stopped. We could make one of the columns a bit, and in the data table, it would either be a 0 or a 1. Um, very, very acceptable to do it that way. The reason I'm doing a string is just so that we can see the words spelled out that say process started or process enabled or process disabled. You could absolutely do a bit and just show it as a zero or a one to show whether that's on or off. And we do want to think about the uh, the length here. So if I wanted to type process started, stopped, this will be the longer one. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Spaces do count, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 characters, plus with strings, there is a null character on the end. So just to be on the safe side, I'm gonna give this 20. I don't have any concerns of memory right now. So we have date, time, the username, and the process date. So now that I have my structure, I can go to my data table and my table and base this table off of that process log structure. And we can see those columns populated here. I'm gonna keep my table pretty small. I'll just do 10 rows. And we are going to be working, we're gonna be working with a data table indexed. What this means is that each row of the data table has an index that we can access. This is the most full-fledged data table that you have the most control over. Um, we do also have FIFO and LIFO, first in, first out, last in, first out tables. Um, personally, I will always recommend index data tables just due to the flexibility that it gives you in the code. And we can also retain this memory. Uh, retaining it is going to make sure that these values stay the same between power cycles so that we don't lose that information. So now we have a 10 row data table so we can track you know, the last 10 events in this data table. And now we just have to determine how we're going to do that. So let's go back to our main routine. And we are going to say, we're, we're going to look at the triggers for writing a data table. So 
if a user logs in, so if we do the positive transition of the user access control event update bit, so if the event update bit happens, that means that something has occurred in the UAC system. A user's logged in, a user's logged out, a password has changed, something like that. Now, in my case, all I care about are two statuses uh, for this example, logging in and logging out. So I'm going to look at that value. So the event type, and again, that event type was in the help file. And we said that it is a one for a login and a two for a logout. So I'm simply saying that if the status is between a one or a two, so if it's a one or a two, uh, then we pass power. And in that case, we want to save our username, so we will store. Store our, excuse me. We'll grab the store string. So if we go down to our strict strings, store string. We are going to take our username and now we have the we have the structure, the process log structure, and we have the data table based on that structure, but we don't yet have an instance of this structure. So say you had four machines and they were all using the same uh, log. Let's say this is machine one. Scroll down type process log, and I'm creating this from my global memory here. So now whenever somebody logs in or logs out, I'm going to take that username, and I'm going to store it into my machine one user. So if a new person were to log in, it would take that new username and store it into user. So right now we're we're going over how to populate the members of the struct. So machine one process log. We need to give values to the date, time, the user, and the process date. So I already gave it date and time here. We're just going to go back and we are going to link that to our machine one date and our machine one time. We have our date, we have our time, we have the username, and last but not least, we need to get the status, the, the event type. So we have the process state as our feedback, a 20 length string. So we have 20 characters to say what is happening, logging in, logging out, whatever it may be. So when the user is logging in, when the user logs in, and the, excuse me, comparison, do an equal check. So if our event type is equal to a one, then we set logged in. Excuse me, let's just store direct here. Let's go to a string. And we'll store string. And I want to take this chance to show you that you can do 
constant string values as well as number values. So numbers are easy. If I just wanted to store uh, you know, a number 23, if I were working with a number block, I would just put the number 23. In the case of a string, it's the pound symbol and then a single qu uh, a quote and then the string that you want and then another quote to end it. So again, just double checking the help file here, we can see that that UAC structure gives us a one as a login. So I want to store logged in into my B, and this is that machine one process state. So the process state is going to be uh, anything we want to say about what's happening with this event update. So in this case, it would be a login, a logout, or the machine changing. So now I'm going to take this whole net, and we're doing a similar idea down here. But this time, if it's equal to two, we are saying that we are logged out. So now we have login and we have logout both being updated. Now we also want to check something on the screen, that light changing state. So on the positive transition, excuse me, positive transition of the process state, this is on screen. So when the process state goes from a zero to a one, we want to store a string. We are going to say process started. You know what, I'm gonna do this to say started process because in the data table it's going to be date time the username and then so it'd be username started process username stopped process started process and we're storing that to our process state similarly on the negative transition on the negative transition of the process state we can say that we stopped the process. So anytime the UAC event updates, we update our login logout process. Anytime the process state goes high or goes low, we update our machine process as well. So with that, we have this structure um, filled out. We have the date, we have the time, we have the username, and we have the process date here. All that's left for us to do now is actually go and uh, write this information to the data table. So right now we have the structure fully populated. And if we go to our toolbox, and we go to our data table indexed. We are using that DTI, data table indexed. And we are going to insert a row. Inserting a row is going to make things easy. We can just keep inserting to row zero, and the other information is going to push down. So I could use all three of these, these three conditions that are populating these tags, I could use all of those conditions in parallel to say that if any of those happen, I want to write something to the data table. What I am going to do is I'm going to set a bit at the end of these nets. So whenever this happens, I'm going to set a bit called log. So I set my bit called log, and any time that I want to log information, 
I will set that log bit. And down here, I say anytime that log bit comes high, so anytime we are logging, we will insert a row to our index data table. A is the data table. We will insert it into table one. B is the structure, machine one. So again, we have given values to all of these tags. And this insert row is going to take all the values, so all of those tags, and it is going to write it into this row number. In our case, we are always going to write to row zero. We are inserting to row zero. Everything else is going to be shifted down. So positive transition of log, insert the row. And then last but not least, we have to remember to reset our log so that the next time we are also able to log the next change. Then one final thing I want to go back here on, this user access control event update bit. That's going to, anytime there's a change of event, it's going to stay on until you reset it. So in this case, you know, in either of these nets, I do what I want when that bit comes on. And after this line, I am okay. I'm done with that bit. So I'm going to reset. That way, the next event that occurs, we detect that positive transition as well. So anytime we log, we're inserting that. And let's go to our data table screen. And you can see over on the right here, we have a data tables drop down. And you can bring that data table over. Also, very quickly, I'm just going to add a navigation button here. So once we get to the screen, we have no way to get back to that menu. I'm just going to quick throw in a button. And I'm going to give that button the action of loading a screen of our menu. Now we have a back button. And I'm just going to go paste this on my other screens. That way, no matter what screen I go on, I have a button that's going to take me back to my menu. So. With the data table on screen, if we go to the attributes in the lower right, we will link our data table. And you can see that we can customize things like the column width. We can do manual drag and drop to manually resize these things as needed. I'm going to keep things at their default. And I'm also going to make this read only. I don't want people to be able to change the values by clicking on the data table itself. And then just to show it, you do also have some feedback as well. So you can see what the last column, row, or array was selected from the data table. So with this system, every time this process is enabled or disabled, or a user logs in or logs out, we should see the corresponding uh, log in our data table here. And after we go over trends, which we're going to move on to next, I will download this whole program. But this is the main idea behind this. Now, in our case, we are logging strings to the data table. Currently, these are you know strings going across the top. Uh, it absolutely could have something else as well, um, such as a number. Um, in this case, strings just worked out the best for the data types that we were working with. All right. So again, we'll test that out in a moment after we download. For now, let's move on to data sampling. 
So data sampling, instead of it being based on some trigger, like a user logging in and out, a process starting or stopping, uh, data sampling is doing just that. It is sampling a particular value or a feed, uh, and it is keeping track of that for us. So if you have multiple pieces of information you're trying to track, and definitely if you're trying to graph it, the data sampler is the way to go. So just to, to show you what I've created here, if we hop to main real quick, you can see I'm calling this function called triangle waves. This is just a simple little function I put together ahead of time. Just briefly want to show you what's going on. This is not critical to data logging, but just to give us a value to log. What I'm saying is every 100 milliseconds, if I'm not at my maximum value, increment my curve value. And if my curve value is ever greater than or equal to my maximum allowed value, I set this max bit indicating that I am at the max. And when this frequency occurs again, I am at max and I will decrement the curve. And I will go down until I hit the minimum. And then I will reset this beginning the cycle over again. So this is just creating a triangle wave going between the min and the max values. In this case, we are going for 25. The curve, two, curve one's maximum value is 25. Curve two maximum value is 50. And curve three is 75. So three triangle waves up and down between 25, 50, and 75. Again, this is just to have some changing piece of information in the code. Um, this could be your temperature, your set point, anything that you want to be logging in the controller. So I'll go to my data sampler. And in total, I'm going to want three feeds. I'm going to have curve one. Curve two, curve three. And we're going to link that to our curve one, our curve two, and our curve three. Now you'll see over here there's the sampling time. Right now it's defaulted to uh, every one second. I'm going to do every 100 milliseconds. These are tenths of seconds. So 100 milliseconds there, and then the folder name, where we are going to store this information to on the SD card. It is very important to note that this does require the SD card to save the information to it. And we'll call it machine one. So we're sampling these three curves. And now that we have a data sampler set up, we can take advantage of the trend elements. So if we go to our trend screen, again, I have not done anything on these screens yet. And we go down to our graphs and meters. You'll see that there are three different types of trends. Trend is going to be the most common. So I'll drag this one over here. Blow this up nice and big. And you can see what this is going to look like. Now, a trend, like I mentioned, is the most common. Uh, it uses. The trend is the most common element, and it uses time as its x axis. So by default, the x axis is going to be your time. You can change that time frame down here. And we link it to a sampler. So there's our process one. And here's our trend. And we could be fine with this. We could download it. But I want to customize the curves a bit. So when I go into my curve configuration, you can see that curve one, curve two, and curve three all share the same min and max values right now. Now, if you remember, curve one and curve two, these do not go up to, actually, none of the curves go up to 100, um, but it's, it's 25, 50, and 75. 
So just to show you how this affects the display, we're actually going to show you both of these. So we're going to do 25, 50, 75. This is where each curve is going to take up the full space when you are looking at that curve. And in this case, all the curves are going to be visible at the same time. So when we actually look at this on the screen, it's going to appear like all the curves have basically the same peak values, but that's just because the maximum value that we're showing is going to be updated while we cycle through those curves. This will become very clear uh, when we show the difference between the two curves, uh, the two trends, excuse me. And with data samplers, you get a structure. So if we go down to process one in my global memory, I have a data sampler structure. And in that data sampler structure, we have a start slash end sampling bit, which I'm going to give a power up value of one. I want to start sampling right away. And you can see a number of other feedback uh, you know, tags that we get for feedback. The most critical one I want to mention here is the create CSV bit. If this bit is on when you stop sampling, so when this start end sampling bit goes to a zero and we stop sampling, that is when the CSV file is created. As long as you have this bit set, before you stop sampling, it will create a CSV file of that information for you on the SD card. So in our case, we're just going to start sampling right away, and we are going to create a CSV. Now I'm also going to put a binary text variable here. I'm going to give this a run stop condition. Stop running. We're going to link that to that process one start and sampling we'll give the action to toggle it this way we can now you might be thinking that we already have this you can see on the trend here we have a run button here which will run or pause the trend it is not going to stop the sampling so it will visually pause the graph, but the data is still going to be recorded in the background. That way, you don't lose information if you just want to pause this graph and look at a particular value. When you hit run again, it's going to jump ahead and you know populate what has occurred since you paused it. If we stop it, it is going to stop sampling. It is going to no longer track those values. And that is why I put this uh, the second one here. All right, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to my Trend 2 screen, steal this button, go to my Trend 2 screen, and I'm going to draw in my second trend. This trend, we're going to use different min and max values, and this is how I would recommend setting your min and max values. So here, we'll link this to process 1. But this time in our curve list, think about the, the, the largest value that you're going to be displaying. In our case, it's curve 3 with a max value of 75. But I want curve 1 and curve 2 to be shown relative to curve 3, meaning that I want them scaled the same. So I want all of these values to use 75 as their maximum value. That way, curve one will look proportionally to be one third of curve three when it has the value 25 in it. And likewise, we have our start stop. 
And then quickly, just to mention the other two trends, XY trend, uh, if you want to graph the, right now we're graphing the Y axis relative to time. If you wanted to graph the Y axis relative to an independent X axis, you could use this. And a live trend is going to show you that information uh, with no data logging. So this is good for controllers that don't have SD cards uh, and you just wanna give them some visual feedback on the, on the HMI. So that is how you utilize the data samplers and trend that information on screen. Enabling that CSV bit is going to give you a file that you can export separate. Now, how you work with those files and get them to that external storage is what we're gonna talk about right now. So one way is using the management tools so in the management tools dropdown, you'll see that we have a number of tools here, file browser, file selector browser. In our case, file selector browser is going to be ideal. And this allows us to move files um, between the SD card and the disk on key or the USB stick. So if you're saving your files to the SD card and then you want to additionally back them up onto the USB stick, uh, you can do that either using this HMI tool or using the ladder logging functions. And the file browser is going to be ideal for moving files internal to the PLC out to that USB stick. So this is one way of moving those files that we talked about. Additionally, you have store DTI to file, which is down here. So let's say every time that we are logging, we're inserting a row. So we can say every time we log, we also want to keep track of how many times we've logged. Say log count. So our log count is going to start at a value of zero. And every time we log, it's gonna go up. So when our log count is greater than or equal, Our log count is greater than or equal to 10, the number of rows in our data table. Maybe that is when we do a store DTI to file, store our table one, start at row zero, target file name, log, Number of rows, 10. And we can either append or overwrite. Just to be simple, I'm gonna overwrite. And we can create a CSV when we do this, and then a status. So if our log count is ever greater than or equal to 10, we store the DTI to file, and we reset our log count. Now with this, the table on the PLC is still gonna be filled with those values. So we can also do a clear DTI and clear that table. So when our log count is 10 or higher, we store it to the SD card, we clear our table and we reset our count. Many different ways that you can go about logging. This is just one example of it.
And just to mention it, there also are these data table functions on the web server as well. So if we were to go down and enable the web server and go to our web page, you can see that we can put that same data table on our web page. So if you wanted to host uh, you know, system feedback that somebody could utilize through the web page while the operator was on a totally different screen, uh, you know, operating the machine, this gives you those two separate portals into the controller uh, to do that. So through the HMI, through the ladder, and also through UniApps. So you can hold your finger in the upper right-hand corner of the HMI and enter UniApps on the screen. And in UniApps, you also have the ability to move files either between the SD card and USB stick um, or even initiating other transfers through there as well. So before I download, I do want to show you the, just in case anybody doesn't have time for the download, I do just want to show you what those two trend curves look like. So this is what the curves look like when all three curves, again, uh, 25, 50, and 75 are the three different curves, maximum values. Um, when you have all of their min and maxes customized, you can see right now I'm going zero to 25. This is curve one. And if I go to the next curve, it highlights the curve so you can see it. And now you can see that my highest value is 50. And if I go next curve, my highest value is going to be 75. But when you're looking at this, this chart, uh, it's, it's not super intuitive how these values relate to each other because that that's you know all relative to that y-axis now we could hide the other two curves no problem uh, and if you were going for this type of view where you wanted to utilize the fold display i would recommend giving each curve its own custom uh, range just like we did here and then hiding the other curves uh, by you know resetting their visibility bit now alternatively In this case, we are using 0 to 100 as the range for all three curves. And now you can see what their values are relative to each other. So you can see that that 25 is going up to 25 and down. So any view where you want to be looking at curves related to each other, make sure that those curves that are related share the same min and max values so that their values are proportional. Let's do a quick compile here. Let's take a quick look. All right, so here uh, you can see that it is saying that the A string is longer than the B string. It wants these to be similar length here. So if I hover over here, you can see that the maximum length for the user access control username is 63. And my machine one user is currently only 15. So if I go to my structure and I go to the user, I'm going to go to my user, and I'm going to edit this tag, and I'm going to make it 63. And now we have a 63 length going into a maximum 63 length.
All right. Also, just to note a couple other quick things that I did ahead of time. I did enable the FTP protocol. So in protocols, FTP, I turned the Unistream into a server so that a PC can connect and see the files on the SD card. I wanted to show you guys that from my PC. So just know that you just have to enable the FTP server to do the FTP functionality. And also in password management, I disable, or let's enable the VNC. I'm going to save this project. And let's do a download all. So after the download finishes, I'm just going to do a quick demo of you know what we've put together here, and then we will be moving on to the questions and answers. So if you uh, are or if you're pressed for time and you aren't interested in the demo or you don't want to join the Q&A session, uh, thank you very much for coming, and you know feel free to disconnect at this point. Uh, if you want to stay for the Q&A and you want to stay for the demo, please stay with me. I'll be hanging out here uh, for quite a, quite a bit longer here, answering some questions and things like that. Also, just to note, the I did add users, and we are tracking the login and logout. I did not limit any functionality to a particular set of users. So right now, all the buttons, all the elements are just open for everybody, whether you're logged in or logged out. I just want to mention that. All right. So you can see that we force that login. Oh, and I did forget to put in screen jumps. So we go to our menu. Our data table is going to load. All right, let's 
log in as an admin. Admin, so A, 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 A. All right, so now we're logged in. So even just that action of logging in should have given us at least one entry. So we go to our name here, our table. Take a quick look at our You can see as I'm starting and stopping the process. And once we have a full table, it clears itself and saves to the SD card. Now, if I come up here and I log out, Let's go as a manager. And if we go to our trend, see all those values going. Stop the trend or start it. And note that this starts all over again. So we're starting with a brand new sampler file. Had the create CSV bit been on, or the create CSV bit is on, so it should have created a CSV file on the SD card as well. Now you can see this is running along. Now if I stop it here, it's still running. Visually, you can see that we have stopped. And you can use, for example, the crosshairs to select a value to see what the time was and what the value was at that time. And as soon as I hit run, this is going to jump ahead a little bit to you know where it's at right now with the value. So all that information in between was still being logged in the background, just visually paused. And you can also take a screenshot as well. So this is all the curves uh, you know squished together uh, using the same uh, or using custom x and y or y min and max values. On trend two, however we set those min and maxes as absolute. So they all use zero to 75. That way all their values are clearly uh, relative to each other. And external storage. So these are the files that are currently on the SD card. So there's my machine one. And you can see that CSV file that was created a moment ago, as well as the data tables. So, or the uh, sampler file. And if I had a USB stick in here, I could check off the file and initiate a move to that USB stick. Alternatively, as I mentioned, I put FTP, I enabled FTP on the controller. So you can use any FTP client in this case, I am using FileZilla, and I'm using the information in the FTP connection here. So protocols, FTP, in my FTP server. My username is UniUser, and my password is UniPass, one, two, three dollar sign. So. I connect using that information. 
and this remote site is the SD card on the controller. So I am now viewing, uh, you know, that process, the, the machine one, right through my PC. So here's that CSV file. This is currently on the SD card in the PLC, yet I am able to uh, bring this over to my computer and open it up. So I can download it and look at it right here. This way you can access the files on the SD card without even having to uh, you know, pull anything in and out of the controller. And we do support being an FTP uh, server or client. So you could also have this FTP server passively running on the PC and have us initiate pushing or pulling files, just like in this case on the PC, I am using the PC as the client to request files from the server, from the PLC. So that covers the, the data logging overview. Um, there are certainly lots of different ways that you can do this. These cover some of the most fundamental ways. I hope you guys found this very useful. Um, please stick around for the Q&A. Uh, I'll be trying to answer as many questions as I can. So I'll be going back. And if you already asked a question so far, I'll be, I'll be going back to the oldest ones and moving down the list. So if you don't have time and you need to go, I very much appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us and have a good one. Otherwise, let's move on to questions. Can you set up ladder code to run continuously when a specific display is loaded? Yeah, absolutely. So displays have an is active bit. So if we go to any display that we want, you can link an is active bit. And this bit is only going to be on while this screen is up. And if you wanted to call something conditionally, we could go, for example, to our main ladder here. And you could say, you know, if that screen is active, screen active, then, you know, call some, some function. And that way, only when that screen was on, would you be running the associated ladder. The recordings will be made available for this, absolutely. Uh, the registration page has the recording links right on it. So after we get this uploaded, the registration link for this video will be replaced with the recording. Do you have to format the SD card before inserting it? So with Visilogic, there was a fixed format for the SD card. Uh, so if using our tool, put a very specific uh, file structure on there. With Unistream, you do not need to format it with a particular file structure. I do recommend starting with a blank SD card or USB stick. So I do recommend formatting it, um, but just using like Windows, you know, do a standard format, wipe it out. If it's giving you problems, do a full format. So when you format it through Windows, uncheck the quick format. Uh, other than that, you're good to go. It will create the files as needed. Can you see historical trend? Absolutely. Um, so if we take a quick look at the screen here. Well, if we go to one of our trends, you know, this has been going for some time. You would just stop it and then you would use the, uh, the tools at the bottom to jump back and forth through time. You can also finish a file, you know, every 12 hours or something like that. That way you're only ever looking through a certain, you know, length of time. In this program, we've created a data table of 10 rows. While saving that table in the SD card, 
be on the 10th row, will it overwrite that or will it store one after another? So for the data table itself on the, on the screen here, we are just inserting into the data table. So we are just inserting into row zero and whatever was on row 10 is going to be lost. So row 10 is gonna get pushed out of the data table. So it's not gonna be there anymore. Uh, row zero moves down, all the rest of the information moves down. The oldest piece of information would be lost at that point. Uh, and that is why when we hit the 10 rows, we store the table uh, to the SD card. Now, if you're referring to when we store it to the SD card, um, that would come down to if we are using a new name, so if we just have a new file name every time that we do this store, then we'll have a new file with all the new information. If we use the same name and we overwrite, so this E parameter, right now we're overwriting. So with this setup, every 10 event updates, we overwrite the old file on the SD card with the, the last 10 from the PLC. Uh, for true data keeping, you'd probably be wanting to do like an append. That way, you know, you'd have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 rows on the SD card as those logs continue. Uh, alternatively, uh, you know, having a naming convention where you don't hard code the name like this, you actually create a string name and you update it. Uh, you change the name, you know, as you as you're logging to the file. Can you please repeat where you can find the RTC to ASCII? Absolutely. So the RTC to ASCII is in the examples folder. So under help and then download sample apps. It's in the UDFB folder. I'll show you here real quick. So if I import a function into my module in my Unilogic examples, UDFBs folder, you can see a number of UDFBs I have here and here is that RTC to ASCII, and I'm just using the V2. And once imported, you just drag and drop it like any other function call. Can we control the VNC display remotely over the internet? Absolutely. So right now, this um, I am controlling this PLC. Uh, it happens to be, you know. 20 feet away from me right now. It's on the same local network as my PC, so it's a pretty short path to get to it. Um, what you'd be looking for is called port forwarding. Wherever that remote location is, the remote location that you're trying to connect to, you would enable port forwarding on the router there, and the port forwarding entry would target the local IP address of the PLC. And then you, from your remote site, would be connecting to that uh, you know remote locations external IP, the IP that you pay for from your internet provider. Uh, so as long as you have that port forwarding step in there, uh, you would be connecting to that external IP and then the port forwarding would get you to the PLC and you'd be able to see the screen just like I'm able to here. Are there in out function parameters? I only find type in or type out. Um, so I'll just show you real quick. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. So please correct me if I'm not answering your question here. Uh, but if I add new function, function one, and I go down to that function, the function in tags are going to be things that are going to be used inside of the user defined function block but they're going to be used by the latter and they're going to be the things that you want dynamically changeable so the things you know a different set point a different uh, option number you know something like that those are going to be your function in and then function out is going to be what you want returned you know after this ladder finishes what are you trying to get out of it those are going to be the function in and function out. Uh, everything else could be global or local memory, depending on, on what you're working with. Can we download the PLC program for this webinar? Um, yes, I will. Um, 
I will make this program, uh, I, I'll get a link for you. I'll get it like uploaded for you. Um, and as long as you've registered for the webinar, I will forward that along to folks in sales who will be able to forward that out to the full registration list. Um, so that way you can have a copy of the program. If you don't get it or you need it sooner and it's not coming, just reach out, shoot a quick email to support at unitronics.com and just let us know what you're looking for. Can the PLC create its own Wi-Fi network? So you would need to connect a router to it. There's no built-in wireless broadcasting hardware inside the panel, um, which honestly is a good thing. Uh, I, I don't think you really want a product that natively it has that kind of a security uh, you know, access, just that wireless access. Um, that being said, you can absolutely grab you know, any little um, wireless router, throw it in the panel, uh, you know, ethernet cable to the to the Unistream and anybody within wireless range of that router is gonna be able to connect to that. Uh, that is a great solution in places where security is a big concern, um, places where they want somebody who's on site to be able to pull out their phone or their laptop and connect to the panel remotely and do lots of troubleshooting, but they don't want the PLC on their network. Maybe it's a military installation or a safety IO where they're not allowed to have any communication going on that network. Uh, you can just put a little cheap Wi-Fi router, drop like 20 bucks, or have them provide a Wi-Fi router. Say, hey, whatever security you need for this wireless access, you give us that wireless router and you plug it in and you'll be able to connect to the PLC. Is there a way to prompt for login besides using the upper right hand corner method? Absolutely. So the login, log out are actions. Um, so for example, on our menu, we could have a login button. And the action that we give it could simply be to log in. Log in, and we also have a log out action. So you could have buttons that do log in and log out. And likewise, you can set the user access control level for which level user can touch that button. And you could basically just say that if nobody is logged in, then show the login button. And if the log, if somebody's logged in, you know, if that login status is anything other than, than no user, then you know that someone's already logged in and, and you can hide that button. Reading a question about eight pens in in trends. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure. I might cut out there. Sorry about that. The the eight pens question. If you don't mind elaborating on that a little bit, uh, I'm just not sure what we're looking for there. Yes, the first two webinars are available uh, on that registration page. So if you go to the same page that you registered for this webinar, the other two listings under full schedule have it. What is the best way to log multiple bit values in a data sampler? Um, so when you say bit value, uh, I think of just on and off. So you know, a data sampler is just going to tell you whether it's on or whether it's off. So it, it really just depends on what you need to do with the information. If you just need to show, you know, what time it's going on and off graphically, you could do that. Um, you could also just log, you know, a timestamp every time that bit goes on or off. So I'm not sure what the multiple bit values are. Um, 
so feel free to elaborate on that as well. So the data storage is limited to the capacity of the SD card. Uh, yes, accurate to a degree. So there is some internal memory for the data tables. So you can use those the DT memory um, without an SD card. However, the memory is limited. So you know whatever you can make in your project is, is going to be the maximum data table size that you're going to be able to hold. Um, but yes, highly recommended to, to utilize that SD card. Um, and to elaborate on that, when you say that it's limited to the capacity of the SD card, truly the data storage is limited to the capacity of the SD card plus the USB stick uh, because you can transfer files between those. So you could say, you know, every 10 files that I log to the SD card, move all 10 files to the USB stick and, you know, delete the 10 files from the SD card. So there's all that file management that you can do. Oh, one thing I, I had meant to mention before that I forgot to bring up is the alarm log. So if you use the alarm system, it automatically uh, logs the events and the comments and things. So I just wanted to quick show you what that looks like. Here's just a simple two, two things have happened in this alarm. The uh, automatic operation was changed on and then it was changed off. So you can see that value and you can see the comment that's associated with it. Um, very simple, um, but very, you know, full-fledged. So as you, as you have the different alarms triggering, you're gonna get different, you know, rows here that are automatically created for you. Can you retrieve data between a specific from and, and, uh, from and to date and time. So not necessarily, it, it, we're just gonna be logging all the information that happens. A couple different ways you could do it. You could be saving it to a, a CSV card, a CSV file, and then you have full Excel manipulation. So you could just do some, you know, within range on the time column and sort the data table, you know, automatically based on that. Um, alternatively, it can come down to how you're logging. If you create a new file every hour or every six hours, then any given file that you're looking at on a day is only going to be, you know, say six hours. It's only going to be one fourth of the day that you're looking through. Um, so you can kind of set your logging intervals to be maximized for what you're logging. There's no way to select a bit value in the data sampler. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. Yes, so uh, the idea of a data sampler is that it is tracking a something that's going to be changing values, a bit being zero or one. Um, if you wanted to track that, you could just say if it's zero, store the number zero into an integer, and if it's one, store the number one in, into an integer, uh, and then sample that number. Uh, and you're basically just creating like a square wave uh, on, on that data sampler. So uh, did we skip alarms? So we didn't really go into alarms. Uh, we just kind of talked about how they're utilized just because this is the logging of alarms is done automatically. Um, I think we may actually be covering alarms potentially in a standalone video. Um, that being said, if we just take a real quick look here and we go down to our alarms, you would add a new group and you would make alarms based on what you're what you're trying to, to, 
to detect. So, you know, a digital condition, say the process state, and maybe any time the process state goes on, you want to say process started. Now this obviously, you know, for our program isn't really a alarm, but just to show you how these are created. Uh, now we have, you know, anytime the process state goes on, this alarm is going to be triggered. Anytime an alarm is triggered, the alarm banner is going to show up on the screen. So this would pop up on the bottom of the screen. And that information, such as the description, as well as any comments that the user makes on the alarm, is going to be logged here. And this is this is what that would look like. So this is a, a digital alarm, the condition going on. And if the user had put a comment in, that would show up there as well. Can we have the low SD card memory warnings? I'm not sure what warnings you're referring to. Feel free to elaborate. Can we send the file of Excel uh, via email? Absolutely. So all of these files are accessible um, through email. Basically, any file that you have on your SD card, you're going to be able to link through emailing. So if we go to emails, and we add a new email. We go into that email, you can see that there is an attachment field here. And in that attachment, we can have the file name. So the same file name that we saved this as, uh, let's say if we go to our So we are storing so we're using the name old log right now. That's the, the DTI file name that we're that we're working with. So if we go back to our email, that attachment field, that file name would be the log. And then we specify what it is. So either just raw, it's a CSV. And now that would be attached to this email. Normal SD cards can be utilized. Uh, micro SD cards, as long as it fits. Recommended size is 4 gigs to 32 gigs. All right, I think that's everything. Uh, if I happen to miss your question, please uh, send it in. Uh, email us at support at unitronics.com or give us a call. The number is 617-657-6596. I hope you guys found this very useful. Uh, I really look forward to next week. I hope everybody can make it next Tuesday as well. And don't miss this Thursday. Uh, don't miss Thursday Visologic with John. He'll also be covering data sampling in the Visologic software. Uh, if you're ever working with the vision controllers, I highly recommend uh, coming back on Thursday and checking that out as well. So thank you very much for your time again and have a great week, everybody.